Let's look next at the Clausius Clapeyron equation. So the Clapeyron equation has certain limitations associated with it. And in particular, the transition volume of a gas is actually extremely sensitive to both temperature and pressure. So using a fixed value for that quantity, the transition volume, is not particularly useful when you're actually asking about a change that will cover a certain range of temperatures or pressures. On the other hand, if what we're interested in is a gas, then things become a little bit easier. And that's because the transition volume for a gas, which is the gas volume minus the volume of either the liquid, if we're talking about boiling, or the solid, if we're talking about sublimation, is really pretty well approximated by just the volume of the gas. The volume of the gas is so much larger than the volume of the condensed phase that the condensed phase volume almost drops out. So if we make that approximation in the Clapeyron equation and replace delta V with just the volume of the gas, and then take advantage of the ideal gas equation of state to replace the molar volume of the gas with RT over P, and since it's in the denominator, that'll give us a P over RT in this equation. And finally, divide both sides by P. Well, when I divide dP by P, dP over P is D of log P. So I'll write that here, D of log P. D log P dT is the transition enthalpy divided by RT squared. And that is the clausius clapeyron equation, which is appropriate to be applied to which kinds of transitions? you have to make a gas. So it's good for sublimation, it's good for vaporization. We can work further with that equation, in particular we can integrate it. And so I will choose a particular state point to begin from, call it temperature one, pressure one, and integrate to a different state point, temperature two, pressure two. And when I do that, what I want to do of course is integrate over single variables. So I'll keep pressure on the left hand side, I'll move dt over to the side that contains temperature. And those integrals are straightforward to do. What you end up with is log of P2 over P1 is equal to the transition enthalpy divided by R times the difference in temperatures divided by the product of the two temperatures. And so that can be very useful to compute the vapor pressure at a given temperature starting from the known vapor pressure at a different temperature and knowing what temperature you want to go to. And so, I'll give you a chance to try that in this self-assessment. Use the clausius clapeyron equation to predict a change in vapor pressure as a function of a change in temperature. All right, well that one is a reasonably straightforward entry of data into an equation. I'll let you pause for a moment to make sure all the numbers worked out for you. Now let's think about uh, doing an indefinite integration of the clausius clapeyron equation instead of a definite one. So in that case, I won't have limits on my integrals. I'll still get log p on the left-hand side. I'll get the quantity shown on the right-hand side, as well as an arbitrary integration constant. Of course, you get a constant on both sides, right? But I'm going to lump them all into a single constant. And what this tells me when I look at that integrated clausius clapeyron equation is that the log of the pressure, if it is plotted against 1 over the temperature, as I vary the temperature, ought to give me a line with a slope of the vaporization enthalpy divided by R. And so if you want to know how do you determine a vaporization enthalpy, for instance, this would be an experimental means to accomplish that. That is, you would vary the temperature using a manometer, observe how a vapor pressure changes, plot that set of vapor pressures against 1 over T, and the slope of the line when multiplied times R gives you the, the transition enthalpy. So a very convenient way to get at it. So in the case of benzene, for instance, as I go from 313 Kelvin to 353 Kelvin, I would find that the heat of vaporization is 32.3 kilojoules per mole. As the self-assessment pointed out, the heat of vaporization itself is a temperature-dependent quantity. 
So the slope over which you have accuracy is a small range of temperatures, and you expect to see a little bit of curvature as you expand over more and more temperatures, and that's just the nature of the thermochemical quantity. So if we ask about that temperature dependence in the transition enthalpy, one way to think about that is just to do a, a polynomial expansion to describe the transition enthalpy. That is, it will be some value, and that's what we've been assuming up till now in the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. It's just, it's a number. But actually, maybe it has some linear dependence on temperature, some quadratic dependence on temperature. If I plug such an expression in to the integrated Clausius-Clapeyron equation, well, now I'll get a series of integrals. I'll get the first integral, which uh, is a constant over rt squared dt, so that'll just give me a negative 1 over t times the constants. This t will cancel out one factor here. I got a dt over t, so I'll get a log temperature term. The t squared will cancel this. I'll get, uh, I'll get a t term. There's an integration constant that's still being carried along. There will be terms order of t squared, and, and those will continue. But this then gives you a way to fit. Again, I can plot my vapor pressure as a function of temperature fitted now to this expression, which is not a, a simple linear plot. You need to do this in some sort of spreadsheet, for example, and come up with the relevant A0, A1, A2 that you can now tabulate and people can look up at a given temperature. Uh, what are my values of, actually it's not at a given temperature, right? This tells you the temperature dependence, excuse me. But given those constants and given a choice of temperature, what is the enthalpy of vaporization, for example? And so just to give you a little bit of a feel for how much curvature there might be, here's not a vaporization experiment, but instead a sublimation experiment. So we're going to work with solid ammonia going to gaseous ammonia. This is uh, not one you want to do in an enclosed space uh, where you're taking deep breaths, but in any case, uh, here you see the temperature range that we're going to go over, a uh, 1 over T times 1,000 in this case. And this is the observed behavior in the log of the vapor pressure. And actually, that, that may look pretty linear to you. If you kind of walk to the side of the screen and stare at it, maybe you'll see that there's some curvature associated with it. And indeed, since what I really would like is the instantaneous slope at any given point, and that slope is the enthalpy of vaporization, Here's what those instantaneous slopes are shown on the right-hand side. So the sublimation enthalpy is going from about 31.3 kilojoules per mole, it looks like. And by the time we walk over this whole temperature range, maybe it's up to 32.1. So that slope isn't changing very much, but there is a little curvature there. And that's because the enthalpy of vaporization does have some temperature dependence itself. Well, that completes uh, what I want to talk about within this lecture. Next time, we're going to make a connection all the way back to statistical thermodynamics and see how we can relate the chemical potential to the partition function.